listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio Welcome to the X-Zone A place where fact is fiction And fiction is reality Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Email me, xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. And you can always find us on any social media site at xzoneradiotv and our main website, www.xzoneradio.com. And we're heard Monday through Friday right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network, the Mutual Broadcast Network, Talk Star Radio Network, and of course, in Europe on Radio X. My guest this hour is James Nato. He is a demonologist and ordained minister who has worked alongside many other specialists in the field. And uh, James is also a paranormal investigator, researcher, co leader of Paranormal Specialty Crew, and the founder of the Dominion Ministry. Now, he's been involved in the paranormal field since the early age of 15, investigating graveyards and legendary surrounding in the New England area, such as Mercy Brown, Lad School, USS Salem, and uh, Slater Mill. His knowledge of the paranormal comes from reading many books in his early years, watching unsolved mysteries, scariest places on earth, and then, eventually, ghost hunters increased his interest and knowledge of the field. Joining me now from Rhode Island is James Anito. And James, welcome to the X Zone. Paul, oh, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. James, what was it? Um, did you have a personal experience that prompted you to become a uh, a paranormal researcher, or or was it just the interest, uh, the interest in the in the field? 
Well, that's a good question. You know, there's a lot of people in this field that have gained um, experiences in the childhood state. Uh, me, uh, I just was very highly interested in it. My aunt uh, showed me a picture of a possibly ghostly figure. I, of course, was young mm-hmm. and I did not have access to that photo anymore. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it wasn't a window. It was like this ghostly figure. So mm-hmm. it piqued my interest. So like I, pretty much like you said, you know, I grew up watching uh, many different paranormal shows, and of course, you know, as a child watching Scooby Doo, um, yeah. so it always kind, of, it kind of always interested me. You know, I thought it was a very interesting thing, even mm-hmm. as a child. You know, you, your imagination's a little bit more uh, opened, so you kind of uh, are more willing to delve into certain things, um, and that's what I did as a child and throughout my younger years. Tell me about your uh, your organization, Paranormal Specialty Crew, PSC. Uh, PSC is uh, a group just uh, between me and Mandy Brown, uh, who is a very gifted individual, mm-hmm. and uh, a few other people that we work with that you know fill in time to time. PSC um, is the group that I have founded with her outside the ministry that works for the ministry that I also founded, and uh, we handle all the cases uh, locally to Rhode Island. Uh, so basically, it's kind of like a sub-asset of the ministry um, that was founded by uh, me and Mandy Brown. How many investigations uh, would you uh, would you think that you and Mindy have done so far? Me and Mandy, uh, I, I couldn't give you a rough estimate. Um, honestly, I'd probably say in the fifties. Wow. Um, I, I've been I've been in this field for about eleven years in June, um, mm-hmm. and um, in my eleven years of doing this. I'll just call it 11 years. It's getting very close to June. I'm getting very old in my mind. But <laughs> getting very close to that you know, time frame, I've done over 400 cases wow. in that time frame. You and I have a lot to talk about this hour, so please stand by. You and I have to also take a two-minute break, and we'll be right back. Exo Nation, our guest this hour is James Anato. He is a demonologist, an ordained minister. And he is also an investigator, researcher, and co-leader of Paranormal Specialty Crew. And uh, they're in Rhode Island. Now their website, www.thedominionministry.com. And we'll both be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exome from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Are you a believer or are you a skeptic? Send me an email. Just put believer or skeptic. That's all I want. Exxon at exxonradio.com. Hmm, don't forget Exxon Nation. Coming mid May, the Exxon Channel, 24 hour, 7 day a week, 365 days of the year of paranormal TV. We'll have more information on that, and you'll be able to check it all out at exxonchannel.com. Don't go away. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. 
I'm Wilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Wilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Star began to demonstrate a metaphysical connection to the spirit world as a little girl. Her family noticed the connection, but it was a great-grandmother who told the family that Linnea was indeed gifted. The great-grandmother, who was also gifted, felt that Linnea had indeed inherited these attributes. It has been noticed that oftentimes, such things are passed down through the generations. Linnea was also born with a call, a thin white membrane across a newborn's face. Legend has it that if the baby is born with this call, the child will have second sight, or what we call psychic abilities. Linnea Starr does past, present, and future, and has the gift of prophecy. It is written within scriptures that if you are able to give factual information, and prophecies indeed come true, the gift indeed comes from the divine realm. Linnea Starr does large interactive groups as well as private gatherings. For more information on Linnea Star or to contact Linnea for a one-on-one consultation, visit her website at www.linneastar.com. That's www.l-i-n-n-e-a-s-t-a-r.com. James Anita was our guest this hour, Exonation. He is the co-leader of Paranormal Specialty Crew, PSC. They're in Rhode Island, and their website is thedominionministry.org. James, where has been your most memorable investigation? Well, I would say the most memorable investigation I would have to say would be uh, I'm going there back in May, and this doesn't have to deal with the involved aspect of anything. I would say, I have to say my favorite location would be Waverly Hills. Oh yeah, I have an uh, I have the choice. To, I have the chance to go back there in May. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe investigator for an event, so I'm very excited. Why is that place still so haunted? Like it's there have been so many different paranormal organization groups and crews that have gone there, you'd think that the spirits would be, get, be uh, you know, so sick and tired of people by now that they'd actually kick them out. Well, yes, and I, and I really do. Um, you know, everybody has a different way of investigating, mm-hmm. a different way of researching the paranormal. I tend to go into places and not ask a plethora of questions. I actually go into locations, and uh, you're pretty much uh, chitter-chatter with the people I'm uh, investigating with uh, because I feel like uh, if I'm asking too many questions, uh, as like a real person, um, they, nobody wants to be questioned like you're sitting in a room but with a cop questioning you. Um, so I like to, you know, chatter, chatter. I like right. to ask questions here and there. But, you know, I think uh, I think it's so active and, you know, people still get success there with evidence is because of just the history that place has had, um, the many deaths. And, you know, I think, I think just the, the, the stanza, the, the mantra of the place um, is just, you know, very, very not dark, but very full of energy of, you know, uh, paranormal activity. Mm. Uh, how, would, how do you conduct your investigations? Because, you know, it seems that each and every organization, group, or crew has their own specific way of, of doing an investigation. So how would you proceed? Let's say somebody was to call you up and they said, uh, James, I, I think we have a demonic 
entity in our house. Can you come with your crew and check things out for us? How would you proceed? Well, there's a, there's a few different processes. I really don't necessarily investigate anymore and bring out equipment okay. because um, I, I'm so busy. So in, in theoretics, uh, if this was a case, somebody called me just now. Uh, basically, I would go through an inter- interview process. I have a questionnaire form uh, about 20 pages long that goes in from the, you know, uh, physical, mental, and, uh, you know, personal aspect uh, to see if anything is going on outside the ordinary uh, that's not paranormal, maybe relationship issues, maybe uh, drug drug usage. Um, what, what also happens depending on the location, um, sometimes I'll send an actual investigation group to go to new locations and fill it out, um, gain evidence see what they say about the client and uh, based upon that feedback and the feedback that I got from the client um, you know I'll come up with the determination that if Mm -hmm. you know I should be involved in the case or you know this person actually needs medical help and which I'm not a medical doctor I I don't have a psychological theory I don't have a medical degree Uh, but you know I have I have the the lucky chance of working with a mental health specialist and you know I know a few psychologists that I could ever call upon just to you know sit down with the individual and maybe say okay this person might have this disorder and you know give my honest opinion to the client say you know you maybe you should go um, go see uh, seek medical help and I don't say it in a mean way right because I don't want them to you know you know feel tarnished but you know we we try to approach clients or investigations very professionally um, and we try to hit um, every demeanor, um, every avenue because we don't always want to say it's paranormal because sometimes it could not be. Out of all the investigations that you've done, what percentage would you say, James, would be caused by demonic entities instead of just spirits or ghosts? Uh, it's a very good question. I, I hear that a lot being asked. Um, out of the 400 cases I have done, uh, and this is a really a great um, kind of show of hands of how demonic cases are very, mm-hmm. very rare. I'd say out of my 10 fingers, I'd say out of those 10 fingers uh, that I ca- can count, um, out of those 400 cases, I'd say possibly demonic, and maybe a few of them truly demonic. So that, that that's a really big uh, difference. 400 to almost 10 cases that quote unquote say possibly demonic or was demonic. Where do demons come from or the demonic entities? Well, you could you could definitely hit that in a lot of staples. There's a lot of theories. You can look at it in the Christian standpoint. You can look at it at many different religious standpoints. You could say it's biblical, or you could just say demonic entities are uh, a negative energy um, created by negative people, negative environments. Um, so there's definitely different theories. I can never truly honestly tell you what a demon is because if we actually ever had that full information, then you know we'd have a better idea what we're dealing with. Um, but being a demonologist, it's not my answer to know what a demon is. It's my answer, to, or, or at least my study, was try to find out or what a demonic entity truly is. So there's many different theories I could give you, but then that would have to be longer than an hour-long show. Um, when we look at the clearing of a spirit compared to the clearing or the exorcism of a demon, you know, we're talking apples and bananas here. How risky is it for you as a demonologist when it comes to getting rid of a demon? Well, it is very risky. And you said one word, exorcism. I do not do exorcisms. I am not a clergy member through okay. any uh, main church, uh, such as the Roman Catholic, the Greek Orthodox, or Russian Orthodox, which primarily does exorcisms. I do a thing called deliverances, but those are still which are equivalently dangerous as an exorcism. Um, they less less more uh, involved than a rite of an exorcism will. But um, to get to your main point of your question is clearing of houses of earthbound spirits or negative spirits um, is a lot easier compared to a deliverance or a a clearing of a house that deals with uh, a highly negative entity such as a demonic entity. Has there ever been a time where you have just nearly thrown it all in because there was one demon or or one circumstance that, that just had you baffled beyond belief and in fact you might have been in peril yourself? 
Um, I wouldn't say it's from a demonic entity. Uh, what happens is everybody in this field, especially the paranormal field, uh, at one point uh, pretty much garnishes an ego. Um, I let my ego get to me. I was, you know, doing a lot of cases, helping a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, as best as I could. Uh, ego got to me, and that one day, uh, you know, everybody hears the inevitable word attachment. Yeah. I grabbed that attachment myself. It ruined my life. You could call it coincidence, but I lost my girlfriend. I lost my house. I lost my job. I financially uh, dropped. You could all call that crappy luck or coincidence. But, you know, honestly, uh, I didn't realize it at first. But the, the weird thing about it is uh, once I realized I had an attachment, I also got, you know, a fellow demonologist who I truly respect um, and believe in. Um, that is brother to me. I had them do a deliverance over me. Um, and I went back to work because um, I, I went through so much and pretty much what I do is I, I have a full-time job, but the paranormal field and being in dealing with negative cases and helping people, you know, it makes me feel like a better person at the end of the day because I at least can, you know, at somewhat my best attempt to make try somebody make somebody smile in their own house again when they have gone through so much fear in their life uh, for months or years. So, you know, when I went through it myself, it kind of like was a smack of reality that, you know, this is what these people go through. How different is demonic possession in reality compared to what we see on TV, for example, in the movie The Exorcist? Um, well, the, the difference is that I've, I've seen you know a few demonic possession cases, mm -hmm. um, which are very eye-opening. You know, the first one I ever seen pretty much tested my faith. Um, you know, it kind of it kind of uh, mentally uh, strained me uh, because you know when you you don't expect to ever come across that, even in the work that I do. Um, and, of course, you see it in movies like Paranormal Activity, The Exorcist, you know, uh, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Um, you know, besides the pea soup and the head spinning around and, um, you know, <laughs> real, a real possession case um, is still mind-boggling. It's still very, uh, very, very, very scary because why I say that is, you know, there's a lot of uh, physical and mental conditions that can contort the body or the craze of face deformation, mm -hmm. such as alien hand syndrome. There's many different uh, aspects where these things could, you know, that person could have it and, you know, some kind of uh, chemical in their mind is causing this. But when you see a, a person's eyes go black, face deformation, um, you, you see you know, super, a superhuman strength, which you could relate to adrenaline. Um, but when you see these things, these people are speaking, you know, dead languages or languages such as Latin very fluently, more than, you know, I can speak it, um, then, then you have some worry signs. But, you know, before you can either ever call somebody possessed, you have to really look at the med medical aspect because you don't want to say, yes, you're possessed, but I'm going to help you because they could have schizophrenia or, you know, uh, or very severe bipolar disease. Um, so you really have to be careful, but based upon what you see in the movies, mm -hmm. um, of course, it's Hollywood. So sure. um, it is bad, but it's not where you're having peace to being spit at you. And, you know, of course, uh, the, the very cursing thing that was said, you know, there is definitely uh, retaliation. There's definitely vulgar things that is said by the possessed individual. Uh, but it's Hollywood for a reason. So where do these demons come from? Do we know, or uh, that gets back to the point where you're asking me, well, what is a demon? Right. Who, who truly, honestly knows? You, you know, as a Christian minister, I can say they, uh, you know, they were created by God and they weren't fully created by God, so they hate the human race because you know we are God's true creation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could you can look at that aspect, or you could say. Uh, demonic entities have uh, some sort of degree to do with uh, the fallen angels or the Nephilim. There, there's many different theories out there. And for me to say where they came from would for me to be to tell you what a demon truly is. Um, you know, all, all, all my field is, is truly theory. Um, and you can base upon it about religion or faith or, you know, a church. Right. Um, but, you know, then I would be lying to myself saying, you know, I do believe in the Bible. I do believe in Jesus Christ and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But I can't really, as a, you know, a person with a brain and a scientific background as well, tell you truly what a demon is. I, I would I would definitely say as a Christian self, yeah. you know, it's of biblical aspects, but I'm not going to tell you that because then 
you know, I truly don't know myself. Stand by, my friend. You and I have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exo Nation, James Anito is our special guest. And he is the co-leader of Paranormal Specialty Crew, PSC, in Rhode Island. His website, www.thedominionministry.org. I'm sorry, that's Dominion Ministry, thedominionministry.org. And we'll be back after this news break. Don't go away. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Thomas Jefferson was a Burgess of 27 when he met Martha Whale Skelton, a 22-year-old widowed heiress who was fondly called Patty by her family. They were married on January the 1st, 1772, and they took up residence in a cabin on the building site on top of a Virginia mountain that Thomas had named Monticello. As Thomas and Patty slowly built their first version of the great house at Monticello, the Revolutionary War was heating up. Patty, with difficulty, bore five children, but only two girls survived. Thomas's political career developed to the point where he was often away from home, but after he authored and signed the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, he resolved never again to leave his wife. He was elected the governor of Virginia, just as that state became the revolution's last battleground. The Revolutionary War ended in 1781, and Thomas gladly retired altogether to my family, my farm, and my books. But Patty continued to want to bear her treasured husband a son, and late in the summer of 1782, she died of kidney failure at the age of 33, four months after having borne yet another girl. Thomas was so devastated by her death that he never remarried, he mourned her for the rest of his life, even as he helped to frame the peace in France and then became the first Secretary of State, the second Vice President, and the third President of the United States. This story is true. Thomas Jefferson was such an obsessive letter writer and record keeper that we know where he was and what he was doing nearly every day of his adult life. Every significant thing he says in My Thomas comes from his contemporary writings. My Thomas by Roberta Grimes is now available at Barnes & Noble, Costco, Target, Books A Million, Hudson Booksellers, Kmart, Walmart, Sam's Club, Walgreens, CVS, and online at Amazon.com. You can visit Roberta Grimes online at www.robertagrimes.com. <laughs> The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. 
Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Unwilling to be the government's deadly assassin, gifted psychic Kahara Mitchell went AWOL and ended up buried under rubble in the wake of a great tsunami. She regained consciousness far from Earth on the medical ship of a Dagaronian intergalactic fleet. Has she been rescued or abducted by aliens? The Chalice of Carrie, Kahira O'Donnell's latest paranormal science fiction romance, is the passionate story of an Earth woman and her destined mates, twin kings from another galaxy. Kahara uses her gifts fighting alongside Lords Rom and Ra in a war that will determine the destiny of galaxies. The Chalice of Kari by Kahira O'Donnell is now available at kahiraodonnell.com or at amazon.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genix provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Annie Callahan, dedicated to negotiating a position for Earth within the Dagaronian coalition, had trained for three years to become an Earth ambassador. Yet, the very eve of her arrival at the capital ruling planet, she is claimed as destined mate to an oversized, mating maddened vamp who swears he will never release her. Lord Astaran, king of the Macian sector, has waited over 900 years for his destined mate, Having found her as an alpha vamp, he is unable to relinquish Annie, virtually holding her hostage until he can claim her. Yet Macians cannot survive without their mate's love. How could he strip her of her citizenship, her ambassadorship, and her freedom and expect to win her heart? With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is the latest book in this exciting series, The Daggeronian Chronicles, guaranteed to keep readers coming back for more. With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is available on Amazon.com and KahiraO'Donnell.com. Welcome back, everyone. James Anita was our guest. He is with, or he's the co-leader, I should say, of Paranormal Specialty Crew, PSC, in Rhode Island. And their website is thedominionministry.org. Now, can you tell me how you perform a deliverance? Well, a deliverance by definition is the action of being rescued or set free. Mm-hmm. So basically what a deliverance is is... 
um, you sit a person down or the individuals, uh, you know, forcefully sat down, depending. Uh, we don't, you know, abuse the client. We do have a waiver program. We are, um, you know, an LLC. We do have liability. We sure. try to cover ourselves just like a church would. Um, we, we do everything uh, correctly. And what basically a deliverance enacts is I have, you know, a set of prayers called deliverance prayers um, that, you know, has been molded uh, to my liking that, you know, I can relate to because it, it's me that is enacting the words, even though you, some people would say God is working through you mm-hmm. or, you know, uh, or whoever your higher power is working through you, of course, um, but it's me enacting the words. So when during a deliverance ritual, um, it consists of holy water, anointing oil, you know, incense can be burnt, um, you know, it, it requires an assistant. I say prayers, the assistant backs me up and says prayers. Um, pretty, uh, the crucifix being laid upon the person's head, anointing the individual, um, Latin prayers involved. And pretty much what the deliverance ritual is, by like definition, like I said, is setting the soul free uh, from the connection of an attachment or uh, oppression or possession. Um, so it pretty much is it pretty much cuts the cord between um, the the predator and the prey, right. uh, the host and the catalyst. Um, so basically, that's what a deliverance ritual is. It's a very highly in depth uh, ritual. Uh, you know. Every you know, technically, any lay person can be involved in deliverance ritual, but you know, you also have to be very cautious because it could be very dangerous. Uh, clients do, uh, d- depending on the course of the action uh, or what they're dealing with, do react very, very badly. Um, try to attack you, or you know, they get sick. So you really have to uh, understand what you're doing, and you know, and it's a, a lot of a process to it. You know, I a lot of people fast or pray for mm-hmm. a week. You know, basically, I motivate myself. I get in the right mindset, and then I go into a deliverance. I, I'll never go into a client's house and do a deliverance if my if my head's not screwed on, my shoulders right. Wow. As, you know. So, how long does it take from the time that you enter the the house to the time of the deliverance, and the time it takes for the deliverance to take effect? Oh, most. Uh, most cases, you know, depending on uh, depending on the client, depending on the situation, could be a few hours, mm-hmm. could be a day. Um, I've dealt with clients, uh, not necessarily their fault. Um, I've dealt with clients more than once uh, in a few day basis or a few weekend basis, where I, ha- I have to come back and uh, you know pretty much consult them and you know re- redo prayers over them. Um, so sometimes it could be a few hours to a few days or even a few months, depending uh, on the person that you're dealing with. Uh, most of the time, uh, I, I will only go to a location a few times. After a few times, I tell the client that um, I'm not able to help you anymore. This is somebody else's number that may be able to assist you better than I can. Or I tell the client that you know I can't assist you because um, if you're not willing to listen to my advice, um, you know, I'm trying to consult you spiritually. Um, I, I, I'm not able to assist you anymore because in, at the end of the time, I do this for free. I don't charge people. Um, so it's, you know, it's wasting my time at the end of it. And it saves me from aggravation, from, you know, beating my head against the wall. Fascinating. Um, how do people attract these demons? Uh, is, is there something that they do? Like, I, I know that we've talked about uh, the lifestyle, whether it's medical, whether it could be the use of a, of a substance or, or whatever. But are there other ways where a person can actually encourage a demon to enter their life? Um, definitely. I do believe that there's different methods. Um, and I really do believe it really depends on your intention. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can use a lot of spirit communicational devices. Um, you know, a lot of people give Ouija boards a bad rap. Um, you know, certain uh, things such as seances. If you're doing these things wrong and you're doing these things with bad intentions, you're opening up the veil pretty much for yourself to be attacked, uh, even though you don't necessarily want that in some in some kind of intention that you are wanting that. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that because a lot of people do certain things such as spirit communication in a negative light, and they're not trying to do it in a negative light. It's kind of like you're, you're doing the digital recorder session for an EVP. Right. Um, 
you know, uh, if you go to a location, and it's not it has to be necessarily a Ouija board or seance or table tipping, um, you can go into a location with a uh, digital recorder or, or tape recorder, if you like the old analog signal, um, and go in and start asking very, very provocative questions, very, very negative questions, and it would be the same way you could come home with an attachment because you think about it at the end of the day, a negative attracts negative. You know, you're a negative person, negative things are going to happen to you. Um, and, you know, I believe in most cases, um, you know, a lot of people bring it upon themselves and they don't necessarily know they did. What can people do to prevent negative entities or, or demons from entering their lives? Well, sometimes, uh, it, sometimes it just happens, but I think the best thing is, you know, what I do, and it happened to me because I got egotistical, and, you know, ego, ego, egotistical beliefs is very negative because you're not think, you're thinking about yourself in a very high, highly way. So I think in most people I can tell is, you know, just try to live a positive life. You know, negative things are going to happen, road bumps are going to happen, but it's how you get over those road bumps in a positive light. Um, in no way, of course, you know, don't dabble in things that you don't know what you're dabbling in. You can read books, you can learn source materials, but when you try to, um, you know, enact these source materials right. and these readings and, you know, these certain rituals and you have no idea what you're doing, then don't do it. You know, it's, and don't go into investigations or locations that are, are highly negative. Uh, unless you, you have a basis of what you're doing or you're around people that can help teach you um, the right ways to do things. And, of course, you know, have faith and belief in something. It doesn't have to be a higher power. It could be a belief in yourself. Uh, you have to always have your head on your shoulders when you're doing this kind of work because not, not even just the negative aspect of it, but paranormal investigation. You always have to be in the right mindset because if you're not, you know, you don't necessarily know what, what's going to happen after that. You never have a game plan. What about Ouija boards? Have you had any experience with Ouija boards and people who have used them and have found themselves in a bit of a a bind? I do. Um, I, I frequently lecture about Ouija boards. Um, I do believe Ouija boards um, are just an intention-based spirit communication device. A Ouija board, of course, you know, was, you know, only formidably mm-hmm. created in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, you know, 1900s, you think about it. You know, even though it goes all the way back to ancient Egyptian times and, you know, Chinese automatic writing, um, it's really an intention. You know, the Ouija board was necessarily not created um, by the novelty company, Kendrick Novelty Company, uh, to be negative. It was meant to be a board game, but, of course, throughout the time, people have... Um, you know, I've come to a custom to believe that Ouija boards are evil, and which I've dealt with cases where, you know, uh, things have happened because of the Ouija board. But, you know, you ask these people, what did you ask on the Ouija board? And they said, you know, they wanted to talk to a demon or they or they were trying to ask stupid questions um, that, you know, pretty much is mind-blowing. So in that aspect, you know, it's kind of like a switch. You know, if you talk to Robert Murch, who uh, who loves Ouija boards, collects some, he, you know, the Talking Board Society, you know, he, he'll say they're not evil. But it really depends on who you talk to. I have dealt with cases where they have uh, created a negative domino effect and, you know, wrecked people's lives. Um, but, you know, it really is, at the end of the day, the intention of the use and the lack of knowledge of the use. When it comes to protecting yourself, when you and and uh, Mindy, I believe, Mandy and, Mandy and other people as part of the ministry, uh, right. the ministry is uh, uh, worldwide. I mean, countrywide in the United States, I should say. So everybody that I work with in the ministry as well. So, so how do you, when you and Mandy go out to do an investigation, how do you protect yourselves from, you know, not bringing anything home with you guys? Well, there's a, there's a few different things. Um, basically, I have a process. Um, I get If I know a case is coming up, I get in a positive mindset. I wear my religious items, which I you know I put empowerment into. Um, you know, she does the same thing. Uh, mm-hmm. Basically, uh, I put myself in a positive bubble. 
And that positive bump will all the way to the day of the case. Um, on the day of the case, I'll get my endorphin, endorphin levels up. I'll get my energy up. And I'll go in there with a game plan. Um, and that game plan consists of uh, like 20 different plans from plan A to plan B. If plan A falls, we do plan B. I go in there with a systematic way of doing things because I always know that there's always going to be something that could go wrong. And that's how I detect myself. I go in there with a uh, right mindset. I go in there with what I believe empowers my protection, uh, my positive bubble, I like to call it. Uh, and that's how we protect ourselves. And, you know, we come in there as positive as we can be, not negative. Because if we're going into somebody's house that they're dealing with a negative situation, right. if I come in negative, then it just pretty much creates a worse situation. So I come in positive. And usually, basically, it has not worked accordingly. Beside that, like I said, that one time I put my head, my head down, got ego, and uh, I got nipped on the butt for it. But, you know, that's that's a mistake. And if you're willing to understand that was a mistake and a learning experience, mm -hmm. you know, you just become a better person. You become better at what you do because you learn from the mistakes that you have been shown in your life. Do you think that the that the occurrence of evil possession or evil activity is on the increase? Oh, most definitely. If you look, and I'm not Roman Catholic, mm -hmm. um, but if you look at the, the exorcist of the Roman Catholic, you look at the exorcist of the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, the people that, um, especially the work that I do, um, if you said 10, 20, 30 years ago, you know, you could look at Ed and Lorraine Warren or yeah. uh, Hans, and you can look at the situations that they dealt with here and there, especially Ed and Lorraine Warren. Yeah, there were very, very much negative cases, but of course the world changes. People, um, you know, human society evolves in a way where, you know, people start believing what they want to. And now, especially in this day of the, in this day of the world, uh, a lot more people understand they have free will. Many people uh, study different religions. Um, and in that aspect, things also look at what's going on overseas and, of course, internally in the United States um, and throughout the different other continents and countries throughout the uh, throughout planet Earth. So things have increasingly gotten negative um, throughout life. So you could look at that as um, pretty much the standing point. Things have increased because negative things have been increasing in life as well. You know, there's a lot more negative people sure. in life than there were many, many years ago. When you guys go out and you do an investigation, how long does it take you to conduct a regular investigation? I'm not talking about a demonic investigation here, but, you know, you go out, you find out, yes, there's a spirit, Uncle Harry's hanging around, or an unknown spirit is hanging around. <laughs> Um, how do you how do you convince the spirit, or do you, to go towards the light, or do you just you know say, hey, listen, it's your uncle Harry, he's hanging around, he's okay. Uh, what do you do? Well, basically, if I'm if I'm investigating in a client's house or a business location, um, and I'm not talking about a ghost hunting location like mm -hmm. Waverly Hills, if I go yeah. and I do a regular investigation of a residential house, uh, what I do is, uh, especially what I did back in the day, is if somebody you know was fearful of what was going on, my determination was to go into there and to actually come up with what was actually happening. If that was paranormal activity or that was you know mold, um, high EMF causing sickness. Uh, you know, certain things like that. A regular investigation, I'd, I'd like to say I'd like to be there eight hours or more. So if I got there at 7 o'clock, I would like to leave at 7 o'clock in the morning. So that's more 12 hours. Yeah. Uh, but I like to do a long process. I'd like to stay throughout um, some of, you know, some of daytime to nighttime um, to daytime again. Because what happens is, you know, people... You know, think you can just investigate during the night and you'll get it. But you actually can investigate during daytime too and still get stuff. Um, because, you know, if you think about it, the spirit world just doesn't activate when it's dark time. Um, so I like to do a very thorough investigation. I like to pretty much every location in the house mm -hmm. or the business location, I like to put ample amount of time into each, each room. So like an hour in each room, you know, I'll set up these devices that will, you know, detect even though they weren't really created to detect um, spirits, uh, you know, we still use these devices to at least try to come up with a cordial uh, way to communicate or 
detect or understand what's going on in the house. So it's a very thorough process. And of course, why I don't really investigate anymore either is because with that thorough process, there's also a thorough, um, you know, listening and watching afterwards too with 12 hours worth of audio and video. Yeah. Um, why do you think the paranormal is so popular these days and more and more people want to become ghost hunters? And there's a phrase I can't understand because you're hunting something that's already dead, so let's scratch that. You know, why do you think it's so popular? Well, look at this. I, I You know, ghost hunters took my interest, and mm-hmm. ghost hunters is what made me start investigating local graveyards, local legendary surroundings mm-hmm. in the New York area. Um, but you think about it, before Ghost Hunters, you know, yeah, you had the Auntie Villahara house, you had these, uh, you know, many other uh, cases that were well known throughout mm-hmm. the country or throughout the world. But with, you know, reality television and Hollywood increasing increasing the paranormal format, right. um, you know, a lot of people came out of the drawing board and said, you know, that's, that's cool. And some people do it because it's cool. Some people do it to actually, you know, help the client or help individuals understand what is going on in their house or to understand what, you know, the paranormal activity truly is. Um, so basically, I think it has increased in popularity because... Of you know, you look at television nowadays. There's a, every every station, uh, of course, besides like the Food Network and stuff like that, you know, has some kind of paranormal or some kind of aspect of paranormal. It's not just ghosts, UFOs, mm-hmm. cryptozoology. It's a very popular thing now, and that is why I think it has increased. You know, if you look at Rhode Island, which is a small state in the United States Union. We, when I first started in the paranormal, James, I'm going. I'm going to James. I'm going to have to hold you here because I have to take my final break. Please stand by. Exo Nation. Uh, James fine. Anito is our special guest this hour, and he is the co-leader of Paranormal Specialty Crew PSC in Rhode Island. We'll both be back on the other side of this break, and you can find out more about James at thedominionministry.org. <laughs> Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. If you enjoy reading a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love From Out of the Woodwork by William S. Peckham. Sean Kennedy, a Toronto contractor, buys derelict houses, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, a century house in ruins, and starts the renovation, the house fights back. He is visited by ghosts of owners past. His visions are triggered by touching an oak mantle, reading a faded letter, 
opening an old locket, or opening a brand new casket in the basement. These visions will take you on a trip across southern Ontario from Niagara Falls to Toronto to Kingston. From Out of the Woodwork is now available in paperback and on your favorite electronic reader. To order your copy of From Out of the Woodwork, go to www.williamspeckham.com. That's www.williamspeckham.com. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, James Zanito is our special guest this hour. He is a demonologist and ordained minister. He is also the co-leader of Paranormal Specialty Crew. That's PSC, and they're in Rhode Island. Their website, www.thedominionministry.org. Uh, James, before we went to the break, you and I were just chatting, and I had to cut you short there. So if you'd like to continue, go right ahead. Oh, definitely. Um I, I totally forgot where I was at. What was the question again? <laughs> oh, Craig says, Craig says, let's let's just go on because we've got about three minutes left. What are your final thoughts tonight for the listening audience of the Exo Nation around the world when it comes to demonology? Well, my final thoughts on demonology is if you truly want to get in this field for the right reason and you want to study demonology make sure it's something you truly want to do it it is honestly a call and i do feel like if you start studying and start dealing with negative cases um it consumes your life and not necessarily in a bad way um but you will start receiving a lot more negative cases so if you really want to get to demonology make sure you know it's something you truly want to do and for people that are interested mm-hmm. in the Dominion Ministry, uh, does have an apprentice program that you know all of our members are able to take under our apprentice and mentor them. So you know that person has somebody that has been in this field 10, 20, 30, 40 years and learn under those individuals and learn the right way. There's a new movie coming out in a couple of weeks. It's about four female Ghostbusters and a male um, secretary. How do you think that this comedy? is going to affect the credibility of organizations such as yours in the public's eye. I don't think it's going to affect it. I think there's smart people out there that can mm-hmm. uh, distinguish the difference between something comedic like Ghostbusters and the actual fundamental helping people and the, the truth true science that we try to make out of the paranormal field. So I don't really think it's a big issue because if you think about it, the original Ghostbusters didn't make this field a laughing stock either, um, you know, before it was very but popular. It, but it wasn't that popular. But you see, the, the, the field wasn't as popular as it is now. Plus, you know, a lo- all of these, all of these uh, reality TV shows are really stretching it now because they need to, there's so much competition that they all have to try and outbeat the other guy. And uh, my personal opinion, they're killing the industry. Well, that's the, the, the that's where it is going to that where that industry of paranormal entertainment mm-hmm. um, will you know weed out. There's going to be the people that you know stay in this field as true investigators, right. true researchers, and true people that help. And you know, yes, it does kind of put it's a double edged sword. Mm-hmm. So it will definitely dampen what people think of the paranormal. But that is where people that truly do this for a good cause will stay with it and fight for the paranormal field to be an acknowledgeable thing. And then those other people that are just caring about, you know, being paranormal entertainers yeah. will, will, will wither will away and, you know, go do something more. James, I want to thank you ever so much for joining us tonight. It's been a great pleasure talking to you, and I hope that you and I have the ability to speak again in the future. But for now, my friend, let our listeners know how they can find out more about you and get more information on you. You can go to www.dominionministry.org, or you can go to jamesnito.com, or you can go on Facebook or any other social media and search me up, James Anito. James, take care of yourself, and uh, be safe, my friend. You as well, and I appreciate you having me on tonight. My pleasure. Good night, James. 
That's uh, this hour, Exonation. James Anito has been our guest. Once again, the website is thedominionministry.org, and James is co leader of Paranormal Specialty Crew in Rhode Island. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. You can always check out what we're doing by going to www.exxonradio.com. Mm-hmm. 